Greetings everyone, welcome to Stoveside Chats. My name is Chad Blackwelder, Food Service Marketing Specialist for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Happy Wednesday, thank you for joining us. Um, we've got a good interview today with Chef Mark Allison. Um, that should be a good one. Aiden Grimes, thank you for joining in and waving, we appreciate that. Elk Valley Farm, thank you for joining us. Flapping Spell, hello. Um, Carolina Ground, awesome, I love you guys, man. If you guys do any baking on any level, check out Carolina Ground. Just go to carolinaground.com. Awesome products. Um, uh, they, they do different kinds of um, grains and flowers. Um, actually, last week, hey, this is Stephen Hagerman, thank you for joining us. Um, last week, I was in Charlotte visiting Mary Jane Wilson, who has a new company called um, Thoughtful, Thoughtful Baking Company, and she's making uh, the best pot pies I've ever had in my life, and she's using um, Carolina Ground to make her um, to make her cross with. You're very welcome. You guys are awesome. Greyhawk55, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that. So um, definitely check out um, Thoughtful Baking in Charlotte, and Mary Jane Wilson is the chef and owner, and she is making some fantastic pot pies, both vegetarian and chicken pot pie using all North Carolina ingredients. So make sure you check her out. She's doing really good stuff. All right, so we're just waiting on Chef Mark to join us. Uh, next week we have Chef Jamie Barnes from What the Fries Food Truck in Charlotte. They're working on a brick and mortar restaurant. So looking forward to having that conversation with Chef about that. And then at the end of the month, um, Chef Sam Deminich from Your Farms, Your Table, also in Charlotte. And while I was there visiting my good friend Heidi Bellotto last week, and some of our Got to BNC members, um, we got food from your farms, your table. Sam is doing, um, I guess it would be considered a ghost kitchen, but uh, check them out online. You can place your order online and they'll bring you incredible, um, there's Chef Mark. They'll bring you some great chef prepared foods using local products. Okay, let's bring in Chef Mark. And I'm working on booking Mark, so we'll get to that. Hey, Chef. Hey, Chad. How are we doing? Oh, hang on one second. Let me put my earbuds in. How's it going? Good. Can you hear me okay? Good. I can. Thank you. Excellent. I appreciate it. Th Excellent. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Thank you for um, the opportunity. Yeah, so everyone who is joining us, this is Chef Mark Allison. He is the executive chef and culinary innovator for Cabarrus Health Alliance. So... Chef, we'll start out like we always do. Um, tell us about your background and how you got into cooking. Uh, I started cooking, Chad, when I was around, around about 14. Uh, and if you can't tell by the accent, I'm actually from England, a place called Newcastle upon Tyne, which is uh, just below Scotland. So my accent is more Scottish. But I actually started around about the age of 14. Uh, luckily, I had a mother who really enjoyed cooking. And I had a father who actually loved to grow fruits and vegetables. So basically everything or the majority of what we ate at home came out straight out of the garden, straight into the kitchen. And I would help my mother on a weekend to cook food. Um, I was the typical really uh, non-attentive student at school and uh, left high school with no qualifications. And um, I just decided, let's try this gig as being a chef because I just liked working with food. And I've never looked back. I've been a chef for 42 years. Uh, I got my first job at the age of 16 working in a hotel. By the age of 18, I was already traveling around Europe working as a chef. Uh, and then at 24, believe it or not, I thought, you know what? I really need to get an education. So at the age of 24, I went back to night school and I studied for 10 years. And I got two degrees and then I became a culinary instructor, and uh, it just went on from there. It's the best decision I ever made. <laughs> it sounds like it. Now, <clears throat> I know that you know working in um, uh, working in kitchens is an education um, within itself. Um, what you what made you feel? Um, sorry, you were kind of buffering out there for a little bit. Um, yeah. But I know that um, you know working in kitchens is you know. An, ex experience, an educational experience in and of itself. Um, what drove you to go back to school to, to reach for that next level? Uh, well, I'm now 57. And when I was in my 20s, I started to think ahead and thought, you know what? I love working the line. I love running a kitchen. But is this really what I want to do when I get older 
and especially in my 50s, would I still be young enough at heart to actually run a kitchen? And I decided more than likely not. Uh, so I thought, let's go back, get an education. And while I was doing the education, I thought, you know what? What I love about uh, cooking is actually teaching the younger generation how to cook. And that's why I decided to become a culinary instructor. And at the age of 30, I became a teacher. And uh, I worked at a, a college back in Wales called Neathport Albert College. I'm very competitive. And I used to train all the culinary teams. And over a 10-year period, we won, believe it or not, every culinary competition in Europe. If, wow. we didn't, if we didn't win it the first time, we'll win it the second time. And uh, I won, or my team won the Nestle Talk Door competition in 2001, which is the biggest competition in Europe. Over 220 colleges compete. And we won a two years running, uh, which nobody had ever done before. And that caught the eye of Johnson Wales University. And they actually invited me to move to America in 2004. And that's how I ended up in Charlotte. Um, and I was a teacher for 20 years, but I just thought long-term, I really need an education because I didn't know if I could be still efficient in a kitchen when I got into my fifties. And believe it or not, there's plenty of guys who are friends of mine who are my age who do a superb job. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just turned 50 this year and I got out of, um, professional kitchens. Gosh, I guess it's been three or four years ago. And yeah. Um, yeah. Like I have a bunch of my buddies who are still, who are still in it. I've got mad respect for those guys, but um, yeah, t 30 years was, was good for me <laughs> for sure. Um, it was long enough. Yeah. And I, you know, I grew up on um, my grandfather always tended a huge farm and we grew up with um, my mom, my grandparents and my grandfather cooking a lot. So I got to experience that a lot and it got me into cooking pretty yeah. early on as well. So it's kind of nice to have that head start a little bit. Um, and I was reading uh, one of your, your, your bios, and um, you, you were mentioning that when you were in home, home econ class back in high school, you kind of got ribbed a little bit by your buddies um, <laughs> being for taking the kind of those girly classes. Um, it, 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 exactly. It, 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 you know, this is going back to the 70s, obviously a long time ago. Uh, and I was, believe it or not, the only guy in the home economics class, all my butch friends we're doing woodwork and metal work. And yes, I did get a few names uh, called, but you know, uh, I think I, I, I used to put myself down as not being that bright, but I think in that field, I, I sort of was because I was in an air conditioned kitchen with 19 women or girls, and they were in a hot, sweaty, dark area of the school, bending metal or carving uh, wood into fish. And I was cooking. I was learning how to cook. And I was in a great environment. And, and I learned two things very soon, which was people love chefs. People love people who can cook. And women love guys who can cook. So uh, yeah. that, that started at the age of 14, 15, and I never looked back. Yeah. <laughs> plus, you, exactly. plus you know, I, I, sorry, go on. I was going to say sticks and stones, right? Like, call me exactly. what you want. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, – Cooking for a young lady, you can win her over quicker that way than carving a fish out of wood, I'm, I'm quite sure. At least you um, can both enjoy the end result. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So um, when you came over to work for Johnson Wells, was that your first time in the United States? Actually, it wasn't. Uh, my first time was back in 1998. I was very fortunate to be accepted by the Fulbright Teachers Exchange Program. Uh, which was started just after World War II to bring the world back together through education. And a limited number are picked for that program every year, and I was one of 30 people who were chosen. And uh, believe it or not, that was going to be my first time in America. And being brought up in the 70s and 80s on Starsky and Hutch and the streets of San Francisco, I naturally thought I was going to go to California. Uh, so I just thought I was going to California. So we were really looking to go to California and spending the year on the beach and learning to surf and doing all American things. And uh, there was only one person out of 500 Americans picked on this program to come to Europe. And he was the only chef, but he didn't live in California. He lived in Alaska. So we ended up, <laughs> we actually turned it down because I had two boys at the time, Jonathan 14, uh, Jonathan two and Matthew eight month. 
And my wife said, we are not going to live in Alaska. And actually, the guy, Glenn Denkler, called me and said, you know what? It doesn't snow very often in Alaska, and it rarely gets below minus. That was a lie. Because we, <laughs> we, we ended up going to Alaska, and we lived there for a year, and we lived in a beautiful log cabin. But there was snow for nine months. And we had the coldest winter since 1964. <laughs> but we had a thoroughly enjoyable time. And then on July the 4th, we flew out of Alaska into Laguna Beach in California. And we realized we were now in America. And uh, we stayed yeah. there for four weeks. Then we traveled to Boston and Cape Cod and uh, traveled around for another four weeks. And uh, the, the whole year was brilliant. We had a great time, a great time. Yeah, well, I was going to ask if there was any um, culture shock, but I guess you had it a couple of different times if you went from the UK <laughs> to Alaska and then to Southern California. I'm sure you were overwhelmed a little bit. Chad, the, the funny thing was Glenn couldn't stand living in England. He said it was too cold. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Had to get back to Alaska, right? But, but I think because you move to England and uh, it's cold and wet, so it's damp. You move yeah. to Alaska, it's cold, but it's dry. So you, yeah. you, you, even though you're cold, you're never really cold. But yeah. it, it was an uh, enjoyable experience. It sounds like it, absolutely. Now, um, uh, I know that you're, um, you had some, um, a couple of situations in your life that um, led you to cooking healthy, um, your son having diabetes and your, your late wife being diagnosed with cancer. Um, and I know that was tough times, but um, I know that you grew a lot from that and, and learned some and you know, some important lessons. Um, I know that that changed your way of cooking, but before that, when you, when you did move to, I guess, to the lower 48 of the U.S., did you see a drastic difference in the diet here than what you grew up to in the U.K.? Definitely. Uh, and it's funny. I was just telling my son this morning, whatever the reputation you have, uh, good or bad, it stays with you for a long time. And Britain has got a terrible reputation as far as food's concerned. But actually, that changed back in the 80s. And, and the food scene in, in England is absolutely phenomenal. And London is like the epicenter of the world for cuisine. You've got some of the best chefs in the world work out of there. But what I did notice when I came to America in 2004, we initially lived down in Charleston. And they've got some absolutely tremendous restaurants. Uh, but... We, uh, our eating habits changed because eating out was a lot cheaper than the UK. And believe it or not, or not Chad, in the first year, I put 20 pound on. And wow. uh, that was due to the fact that I wasn't eating fresh fruits and vegetables. It was basically takeout and fast food. And I realized there was something wrong there. And you're right about my philosophy changing about food because I was brought up on French cuisine, lots of butter, sugar, salt. And then while we were living in Alaska, my youngest son at the time, Matthew, who's now my middle son, he became a type 1 diabetic. So we changed our eating philosophy. Out went the butter, the sugar, the salt, and in came healthy food. Um, and then in 2008, my wife was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer, and she was given three years to live, that we radically changed our eating habits and uh, mainly went to a plant-based diet. I still eat meat, I still eat fish and dairy, but that's a very small percentage of my diet now. And what I do with Cabarrus Health Alliance is actually teach the community how to pick and choose uh, better food products, hopefully local food products, hopefully fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, and how to cook them at home. Um, and it does improve your health. My wife uh, lived for eight years, even though she had been uh, diagnosed to only live around about three years. And she thoroughly lived every day of her life. And I'm sure it was because she was, had a positive attitude, but I'm sure it was the uh, diet as well. And that's what I try to do now. My whole philosophy is to eat fresh. Yeah, it's a good philosophy. And you're absolutely right. I know that you, a, a couple of weeks ago, you posted um, on Facebook this incredible looking breakfast you had of some cured salmon and a very light um, <laughs> looking breakfast in that same day I had overindulged on biscuits and gravy and just felt groggy <laughs> and tired for the rest of the day. And I knew I was going to, and that's, you know, I, I do believe that you are what you eat and it definitely affects, you know, how you feel and how you approach other things in your life as well. When you're, when you're eating healthy and uh, taking care of yourself, um, talk a little bit more about um, the um, Kabaras 
um, Health Alliance, and kind of you mentioned it a little bit, but what's your what's the overall mission of the alliance? Uh, the overall mission it, it's a health department, so the mission is basically prevention. You know, we're doing a lot of work at the minute with COVID, uh, and I'm actually helping with the at the clinics. Uh, believe it or not, I'm actually one day a week I'm directing traffic. <laughs> That's me volunteering to help the community. Uh, but we do a lot of uh, Zoom meetings where we actually teach people. Uh, virtually how to cook uh, and the mission is really all about prevention or if you've got some kind of illness trying to reverse that illness by taking care of yourself exercising more getting out into the sunshine uh, looking at the food that you actually eat uh, how well your sleep patterns are uh, because it all affects the way you behave and, and also your mental perspective of, of life so if you can eat the right food and you get enough sleep and you get outside and get enough vitamin D through the sunlight and you exercise, then hopefully you're more positive about your life in general. Absolutely. Um, now, I know that keeps you really busy. And on top of that, you also do work with Forever Oceans. Um, tell us about your role with those guys and, and what their mission is. I, I am really excited to be working with, with this phenomenal sustainable seafood company. It's a startup company. But all the uh, technology they use was from um, uh, working with uh, companies that look at how they can look at fish over a 24-hour period, uh, maintain the quality of the fish. Um, and it's, it's an amazing product. I just got the first samples from Hawaii about three weeks ago, and they're looking at what is called Kahala which is an amberjack family at the moment. So everything was flown in from Hawaii and the product was absolutely amazing. I'm just so happy to be involved because it is a farm raised fish, but the fish are farmed around about a mile off the shore in a depth of water that's about a mile deep. Uh, so it's basically farmed, but the, the fish are actually in a wild environment. Uh, and the product is absolutely superb. Uh, at the minute, what they're feeding the fish on gives uh, omega-3 four times the amount of omega-3 than wild salmon. So it's, yeah. it's a really health, healthy fish, you know. Uh, it is farmed, but it's basic, basically farmed in a wild environment. So I'm really excited. I've been working with this team now for the last eight months, and it's exciting what they're going to do, you know. Yeah, I was, um, I was doing some research and, and checking out some of their initiatives, and – you sit on their culinary board as well with some very talented chefs. And the one that stood out for me because I grew up cooking a lot in the late 80s and, and 90s and um, Rick, Rick Moonen, um, who was just a, an awesome chef. And yes, somebody who I was just like kind of idolized from, from very early on. So it's, it's cool that you get to rub shoulders with those guys. Uh, Rick is, is considered the um, seafood sustainable uh, guru. Uh, yeah. in the country and I'm actually uh, working with Rick in three weeks uh, from now we'll be in Virginia together working for five days doing a lot of promotional material a lot of uh, photo shoots and videos uh, and he is a great guy absolutely tremendous guy I've known Rick for quite a while and he's got a great personality and he is the ambassador for uh, the company as far as the sustainability of the food and the fish so it, it's just a pleasure to be working with him it, it, you know it, it Chad, it's amazing. I've done 42 years in culinary, and it's amazing the, the, uh, the gifted people that you come across in that time span uh, that you become friends with. And, and like I used to tell my students at Johnson & Wales, it's a very small top tier of chefs, but if you can get into that circle, they're always uh, willing to help you step up that next run of the ladder, you know? And if you're hard work and you're persistent and you've got determination – you can easily get that next level just by the people that you associate with. You're exactly right about that. Um, and, and, you know, when you're in that kind of company, it's just, there's so much to learn and, and to take in. And um, that's fantastic. Now you wrote a book a couple of years ago, um, three boys, <laughs> three boys and a chef, or actually that was, was that last year that that came out? Uh, uh, that came out about three years ago. Okay. Three uh, years ago. I, 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 actually I, I've wrote, <laughs> I've wrote four books so far, but oh, wow. okay. none of them are doing really well. 
I wrote uh, a book on how to get into culinary arts if you were at high school and you wanted to go to culinary school. Uh, that came about 10 years ago. And then about three years ago, in memory of my wife, I, I brought out a book called Three Boys and a Chef. And it's all our home recipes. Then I came out with Three Boys and a Chef 2. And then my, with my middle son, Matthew, being a type 1 diabetic, we actually wrote a book together. And it was called uh, Get Smart About Diabetes. So I've got four books out, but it's one of them problems, Chad. If you're not a celebrity <laughs> chef, <laughs> no, that's you're, true. you're that's not going to sell that many copies, but they've, they've yeah. sold enough to keep me happy. And it was a pleasure making them, you know, pleasure to write them, you know, just to, to get it out there, which was good. Well, and I'm sure in your, your quest to educate others, you probably got a pretty good education writing those four books too, right? Exactly right. You know what? I, I think the number one thing in life is education. Whether you go to university, college, or school, whatever it is, or the university of life, it's all about education because you don't know what you don't know until you learn it. And I try to learn something new every day. And my focus now is nutrition and how to be healthy. Uh, I recently had a, a, my annual, and uh, I am back down to the way I was back in 2004. And I work, I work out six days a week with uh, my three boys. And uh, my total cholesterol was 149. Now, that, that's amazing for a 57-year-old. And it was amazing to me because there's no documented case of ever being, having a heart attack if your total cholesterol is under 150. So I, I, I was just thinking, I must be onto something. And it's just really eating fresh fruits and vegetables. There's nothing yeah. complicated. I think we overcomplicate life. And if we just look at what the body needs, it's more fruits and vegetables. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. I, th I do think that we tend to kind of overthink things sometimes. And um, back when I had my last restaurant, I had a physical and my cholesterol was like 210. Yeah. Um, and it's back down to where it's supposed to be now, but that's, you know, very good. Not eating as not eating as much butter, or, you know, exactly. drinking as much bourbon and stuff like that. So, um, all those little things do help. And I, I did want to mention that not only were you an instructor at Johnson Wells, um, you were also um, became the dean of culinary arts as well. So that's that's a very very cool role. Uh, you know what, Chad? It's amazing to think this this sixteen year old kid that left school with not one qualification ended up being the Dean of Culinary Arts at Johnston Wales University for uh, seven years before I left Johnston yeah. Wales. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an example of, you know, even if you don't do that well at school, don't give up. That's Just right. find out what you actually love in life and then go after your dreams. I think the problem is we stop dreaming and yeah. life takes over and you've got to continuously dream about what you want to do and if, if you can find a purpose in life, it's usually by helping other people and usually by doing something that you love to do. And, and I've been lucky. I tell people I have never worked a day in my life because I really enjoy everything I do because it always revolves around food. Yeah, I worked for an Italian chef long ago who said the same thing. If you feel like you're working at this, then you should go do something else. And I was the same way. I was kind of a C average student until I went to Johnson and Wells in Charleston and then something clicked and I ended yeah. up on the dean, Dean's list and stuff that I never thought was even, was even possible. But, you know, you again, you find something that you're interested in and it's hard to, it's hard to turn off that, that, that switch. You're so, that, yeah. yeah. You're so curious all the time about everything. And today, like I learned so much with this job about yeah. just what's being grown in North Carolina and, you know, meeting new chefs and learning new techniques and all that sort of thing. It's, Really cool, and I could I could geek out on it for hours, but we are out of time. <laughs> um, is there anything that the folks need to know about what's going on at the, the Health Alliance or um, anything else you're doing, any of your blogs or your cooking lessons or anything like that? Uh, you know, um, what we do at the Cabarrus Health Alliance is absolutely amazing because it's all about the community and helping people. Uh, and, and as far as I'm concerned, I, I just love helping people. I, it, it's amazing how many students reach out to me from Johnston Wales. I've just actually secured two people in new positions. And if anybody needs any help with anything, just reach out because I'm always willing to lend a hand. And if you're in culinary arts or you're in agriculture, because North Carolina is absolutely tremendous for agri agriculture and farms, you know, yeah. you're, doing, you're doing a fabulous job, especially during this pandemic. And it's, it's all really about helping people. If you can help somebody 
uh, one day. Hopefully they will return that favor in the future. But it's always nice just to actually guide somebody in the right direction and give them a helping hand because life can be tough. And everybody needs that helping hand every now and again. You're right. That's so true. And yeah, um, absolutely. Great words of advice. Um, thank you for all you do, Chef. And you guys make sure you're following Chef Mark Allison on Instagram and Facebook. And also congratulations on getting recently engaged to, I've oh, never met you. her, but your, your <laughs> lovely fiance, uh, Jacqueline, I keep up with you guys on, on Facebook and you're a lovely couple. So I wish thank you guys you. the best. Thank you, Chad. And thank you for the invite. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. You, you bet, my care. friend. I'll Thank talk you. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. All right. What a cool guy, Chef Mark Allison. Um, I got to meet him a couple years ago. He was judging one of the um, NCRLA chef showdowns that the Department of Agriculture sponsors that we are doing again this year, so I'll keep you abreast of that. All right, next week, Jamie Barnes from Charlotte and what the fries almost slipped up there with the fries food truck. And then the week after the, that, Chef Sam Deminitz. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next Wednesday.